Hello there and welcome to part nine of A Study in the Study, A Gospel to the Point. I imagine by now you should know what you need, but here's a reminder anyway. You'll need a Bible, something on which you might take some notes, as well as a good cuppa, which you can enjoy as we meet to study God's word together. Let's begin with a prayer. Lord God, prayer is such an important part of the Christian faith, and yet, so far we have not really reflected upon it. And so as we turn to what is one of the most important prayers that Jesus himself ever said, we pray that you would grant us wisdom and understanding, as well as an appreciation of the power and importance of prayer. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We are approaching a critical moment in Jesus' life. We've been getting to know him over these studies because to know Jesus is to know the answer to the question, what is Christianity all about? We've seen him love and show compassion to the people of this world, committing himself to God's overall plan of salvation and being the one to bring that plan to fruition. He has acknowledged that this will require a sacrifice on his part and that will mean his death. It is also likely he was more than aware of the reality this would not be a quick nor painless death. It would be long, drawn out and painful. This brings us to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus' last moments as a free man. We read about this in Mark chapter 14, starting at verse 32. And I hope you will read along with me either in your own Bible or by following the link in the description below. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Amen. I began this study by acknowledging the importance of prayer in the Christian faith. Prayer is the time we spend consciously talking to God. We can do this out loud or just by thinking. Either way, we believe that God hears us when we speak with him. Although actually, we believe God hears us at all times. There's just something particularly special about taking time to speak directly to God. Prayer is also about listening. We are at liberty to speak to God about anything and in any way we like. For an example, you might want to revisit the study in the study titled A Prophet with a Complaint to learn more about this. We are then called to listen. Sometimes this means reading the Bible to hear God speak to us through his word. Sometimes it means having a time of silence, waiting to see if any thoughts or revelations pop into our head, helping us to make sense of what we have shared with God. Sometimes it can even mean getting up and going on with our day, but remaining conscious of God and watching for how he will respond to us through the circumstances we encounter. In all honesty, I can say that I have known God to speak to me through all three of these ways. 
what follows is a somewhat overly simplistic way to think about prayer. But God can answer our prayers in one of three ways. Yes, not yet, or no. Either he will affirm what we are asking for and grant it to us. He will affirm what we're asking for, but for some reason hold off from allowing it to happen. Remember, God's perspective is far greater than ours and he will have a good reason. Or we, he will consider what we are asking and say, no, this is not something I can give. The third response is the hardest to hear from God. But we learn to trust that his reasons will be sound, even if we do not and cannot understand them. Much like a parent who denies their child something for their own good, God will sometimes deny us. But that doesn't mean that God loves us any less. Often people will talk about this no answer as prayer being unanswered. I can understand why people do this. It's a kind of shorthand. It's easier to simply say an unanswered prayer rather than a prayer to which God has answered no. I do, however, think calling these prayers unanswered is problematic, especially if people don't realise this is shorthand for something else. If you aren't in the know and you hear someone talking about unanswered prayer, I think it would be fair for you to assume that they mean God has chosen not to respond at all. This creates an image of a great and mighty ruler sitting tight-lipped on his throne, caring so little for his subjects that he cannot even be bothered to give a response to the pleas they bring before him. That is not the God of the Christian faith. He loves us and cares deeply for us. When we come to him in prayer, it's more like a child approaching a loving parent than a subject approaching a king. He delights to hear from his children and always responds to us. Hence, I find the idea of unanswered prayer difficult. For God always answers, although sometimes he answers with a no. What about Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane? Some call this Jesus' only unanswered prayer, for he asks God his Father if there is another way for him to achieve salvation which does not involve his death. Some could interpret the silence from heaven as God's refusal to answer, but I think not. I think Jesus does receive an answer to this prayer, but it is a resounding, yet heartbroken, no. God has been figuring out this plan of salvation from the moment humans rejected him and brought the misery of sin into our world. Someone must pay the penalty of sin for all humanity. It has to be a perfect person, someone who can willingly choose to be our representative and take the punishment we deserve, thus setting us free. If there was another way, God would have found it. This is the only way. So with a heavy and sorrowful heart, he hears his son's plea for another way and says, No, my son, there is no other way. You must do this. There are two things which are noteworthy about Jesus in this moment. First, although we acknowledge that he is God in human form, and with that comes a great deal of power and authority. He is still a man. He has experienced hunger, thirst, joy, sorrow, and now he experiences fear. Jesus' humanity is on show here as he faces up to the reality of the pain he will endure for us, and he admits, I'm afraid. If there is another way, can we not do it that way instead? I find it deeply moving to think of Jesus experiencing this sorrow, this pain, this fear for us all. Second, and despite his fear, we see his commitment to God's plan and to us. At the moment of Jesus' arrest, he stops his disciples from protecting him with the words, Do you think I cannot call on my father 
and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? The reality is that at any point, Jesus could have walked away. He had the power and the authority to do so. He did not have to do this if he didn't want to. Yet, as God in human form, he remained committed to saving us. He was willing to make that sacrifice. Why? Because he loved us. I have been reflecting a lot recently on the difference between duty and love. You can do the right thing, both from a sense of duty and a sense of love. Duty will, however, only take you so far. And when a situation begins to demand more than you believe your duty expects, you will either begin to resent that which you are doing, or else you will stop and go no farther. Love, on the other hand, allows us to go well beyond what might be expected of us. When we love, we find joy in going that extra mile. We delight in giving our time, effort and energy. We gain a sense of satisfaction seeing the positive effect our love has on others. When we love, it is easier to sacrifice our own happiness and well-being because we genuinely value the happiness or well-being of another above our own. Love is a powerful motivator and a beautiful path to walk. It was Jesus' love which motivated him to keep going, to die for us. Even although the path he walked was dark, painful and excruciating, it is also beautiful because he walked it out of love for us. Was Jesus' prayer unanswered? No, it was answered with a no. And Jesus was okay with that because despite his fear and anguish, he loved us more. Indeed, as the Bible itself puts it, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Next time we meet, we will read from Mark chapter 15, verses 33 to 41. So I encourage you to read up to that point before then. For now, may God bless you, and I'll speak to you soon.